Kitco Mining special coverage of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference is brought to you by First Mining Gold. Peru is the world's number two a copper producer. That is where Ivan Bebek's Copernico is located. Ivan, welcome to Kitco. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, Ivan, uh, bring us up to date with uh, Copernico. I believe this is part of the Orin story. Yes, uh, so we took on Orin from 2015 to 2020. We raised over $150 million with some bright geologists from Newmont looking for some of the world's largest discoveries. We came up with copper, gold, and silver opportunities. And that's where we had the Sombrero Copper Gold Project in Peru. Um, been at this project with Orin to now for about seven years. We've spent $18 million to get to this stage. Uh, we've had access for a couple of years to bring it to the drill ready stage. And it is a really unique opportunity in terms of scale, lines of evidence, not just to analog a world-class discovery or a deposit like Las Bombas, which is being mined in Peru, but the entire trend of deposits that Las Bombas has. And, and the story is quite unique. There was a, a big trend of very prolific mines they were exposed on the surface, but then they were, as you move west, they were covered by volcanic cover, a thin layer of volcanic cover, so you couldn't see the rocks. And the absence of evidence is not always the evidence of absence, is the kind of the old adage. And uh, Miguel Cardozo, who was credited with uh, the discovery of Anacocha, which is a 60 million ounce gold deposit in Peru, he was onto it first. He brought Dave Smith and Michael Hendrickson, our Newmont geologist, into the picture. And we started trenching, we started doing the age dating to confirm it had all the key lines of evidence and the scale, which is massive, to be something like a Las Bombas or those other mines. And that checked all boxes. And then we were trying to renew a social agreement. Politics changed in Peru. They finally have gone, believe it or not, in a very positive direction for us and the mining industry in Peru. They've gone back to centric versus ultra left. And now we are in the final stages of getting access to be able to drill this project, which we believe is, or I personally believe, is globally significant as the number one copper gold undrilled exploration project in the world. I want to talk about uh, Peru in a moment because it's certainly been in the headlines as far as what's happening there. But uh, first, uh, looking at your deck as well, too, you had a number of benchmarks. You had a number of comparisons about uh, the project that you're focused on. And uh, also, I, I forgot to mention as well, too, your co-founder and CEO of Copernix as well. But uh, maybe you could talk about some of those comparisons with what you're focused on and some other copper projects. Sure. So Las Bombas, as I said, is, is a notable one. Yeah. This was in 2020, the ninth largest copper producer. It's owned by MMG, a Chinese group. They've had their ups and downs with the mine, but it is a key mine globally to the copper supply. Uh, Tintaya was an extremely profitable mine that used to be owned by BHP. That's a half a billion tons of 1% copper. Both of those have analogs. Um, Los Chancas is a multi plus billion ton deposit nearby us. Um, Constancia is there as well. So these are very well known, extremely pro prolific mines. Now they occur in different types of rocks that all have a similar relation in terms of when they were formed and the event that caused them. And we not only have those host rocks, we have some additional ones that are also mineralized. So do we have more? Do we have multiple opportunities? Can we deliver a Tintaya, a Las Bombas, and a Costantia in our land position? It'll take us a long time because we're very target rich. And right now we are permitting to drill 48 holes in our first seven kilometer long target. That's continuous with exploration results and surface. So it's exciting. This is really elephant country and we're on the edge of something that could be su substantial. And the analogs are not different, they're the same. The shape of them, the age of them, the mineralization is the same. So it gives us a lot of confidence, but the risk does fall on grade. Do we average? 0.5 or do we average 0.2 copper gold equivalent or 1% copper gold equivalent? So there's risk always with good projects, but when you're as target rich as we are, we're going to have longevity to be there for a few years to figure out if we don't have it. And that's the beauty of having such a key land position in this belt. Talk about Peru right now. We'll just talk about the country first. Uh, we had the problems with uh, Castillo, which uh, he was removed from office right now. And then there has been troubles that have been happening in the country. Uh, what's going on? So in terms of that, I've been there for seven years. There have been six presidents. So I did not get any blood pressure when Castillo was removed. It was actually a positive direction. He lost midterms first, went to a centric party, and then he was impeached shortly after, right? So where I did get a little bit frustrated is the short-term theatrics that go with it. And there's some, some riots with some casualties that is really unfortunate. Um, these are subsiding slowly, which is a very good sign. We think they'll subside in the not too far future. But if you look at Chile, 
who tried to uh, nationalize mining and it went to Congress for a vote last year. There was huge riots across the country for it and they ended up pulling back to Cendric. They did not nationalize. And you look at what just happened in Brazil, mm -hmm. Peru's taken its turn. And I think you're seeing a big political shift in South America, not too dissimilar from the US as well as Canada where we've had some issues as well, where we're moving back towards a more centric versus a far left kind of uh, government in power, especially in a commodity rich areas like South America. So we, we look at it as, um, you know, we're very cautious of it. It's uh, given us reason to be patient in case it does take longer. And that's expanded our business plan. Uh, we spent the last year knowing that Peru is a risky place to be at times, going into other places. And we've chosen Ecuador as, uh, as a place that's been through this in 2012 and is on the rise of one of the most fertile countries that's underexplored. It's Peru or Chile 25 years ago in terms of opportunity. And we plan to come up with similar scale opportunities that we have, although earlier stage, because the country's seen less exploration as we head into this market. And that will provide multi-jurisdictional reduced risk geopolitically. It will provide additional exploration upside. And if we get fortunate to find it in more than one projects that we end up with the company, we're gonna be exceedingly careful how we monetize that for shareholders. Spin and sell each asset we find would be the, would be the goal. But these countries, regardless of the political challenges, which we're there, we're in country, we have an incredible social team, we live in the towns that we're working with with our social team. We have an incredible SVP of uh, corporate development as our country manager as well, Christian Rios, he's Peruvian. We speak Peru in Peru with two Peruvians. And if they tell us not to worry, we generally don't get too excited about it. And the media always picks things up and, and the story's great when it's told with, with a lot of theatrics, but mines are still operating. We're getting permits without any delay. In two days, we extended our drill permit environmentally for two years during the midst of the turmoil. People stop traveling for a bit, let the, let the, uh, the riots subside, but it's calming down. So we're very bullish. We think that commodity-driven countries are so careful not to destroy or to interrupt that but they have to sort out their politics between themselves. Ivan, let's kind of step back. Uh, we are at, uh, it's just turned uh, February. We're early into 2023. Uh, you've been in the resource sector for many years right now. Uh, where are we in the cycle right now? We had just an awful 2022 where we had the Fed tightening that was all about the Fed. Uh, we've seen that uh, metal prices have really come unleashed after we see that uh, there's, uh, how would you say, a pivot or a turn or a softening, which is happening uh, with the Federal Reserve. So I'm, I'm a gold bug naturally, and now I'm a copper bull. You know, yeah. that's the way it's going. And I think that the macro picture is stronger than it's ever been. I think during COVID, the money printing came out first, the easing, yeah. and that had to be solved with rising, raising interest rates. And now we're going into a highly inflationary environment where metals tend to do quite well. But I view a different part of the business where I look at the supply and I look at the demand. I was just on a copper panel here at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. And every panelist agreed that the gap to fill, to satisfy the EV demand, the modernization for climate change is beyond China. It's global now across all governments. It's gonna be hard met probably going to take about 10 to 15 years to bring some more significant copper supply into the market. And we're not going to be able to satisfy the demand for the EV world at the pace that the world wants to go at, which gives us confidence that the copper price is going to perform continuously. As far as the golds go, the macro picture is laid out. There's a war in the Ukraine. There's rumors of a war possibly with China coming up. It's not a fun environment to live in, but gold, th gold thrives in that environment. And if the rate hikes start to slow as they're anticipated this year in the US, you're gonna see gold go through 2100, which has kind of become the benchmark for gold. The old $1,000 an ounce, or when I started in the business, $300 an ounce was a marquee that would trigger the in equity investment climate right down through the juniors to the majors. Now, the mining business in terms of important business globally is one of the most important in the world and it's one of the smallest ones. So when the world catches on to how much shortage we have in these metals, how many gold mines are slowly deteriorating through their production and supplies not being replenished or copper mines are not coming online because they take a long time to build and get online, I think it's gonna be a very small door and a lot of really big investors that will come through and the industry is gonna re-rate at a considerable pace and, and it puts us in a super cycle, the start of the super cycle, not just from the supply and demand, but from the investment perspective. We're coming out of a 10 year bear market 
We've seen companies contract workers on cash flow. They've shut down a lot of the growth aspects of exploration and that turning that back on takes time and mines aren't being found anymore because the easy mines that could be found previously have all been found and they're being in mature stages of being mined. So there's a real crunch in the commodities, supply and demand. There's an incredible macro picture. It's kind of the perfect storm in that sense. And we never had electric vehicles really in, in presence before 2012. Plus we have this big movement, which we all support for the climate change and decarbonization of the planet. So copper ranks as the top, gold is up there, silver, cobalt, a lot of the key essential metals are gonna perform well in this inflationary environment we're heading towards. There's a lot of support that is uh, for miners that uh, miners and uh, downstream production that are coming home. I think of the Inflation Reduction Act that they had with Biden. You see what Canada has done some work and you see the investments, uh, investments are pending or announcements are pending what's going to happen in British Columbia as well, too. Is there a bit more favor for people coming kind of for first tier jurisdictions in terms of developing projects? I think that everyone's after scale right now and quality. And that's where people are going. And if you can meet that in a first tier jurisdiction, great. But if you go to those first tier jurisdictions, things are well picked over. It's not easy. And so it's not as easy as it sounds to go get there. The capital availability is going up. There's gonna be a lot of investment downstream from major mining companies to encourage juniors to come into the space and to go make those discoveries. But if you find a big copper mine, it's 10 to 15 years to drill it. It's another 10 to 15 years to build it if it's consequential in scale, the kind of scale I'm advertising here that could make a top 10 in the world or top 20 in the world type of discovery, right? So I think everything's gonna go really slow. The new ESG movement, which we certainly support, a cleaner mining world, and, and we're participating in that in, in a very unique way above most companies, um, it's caused a, a lot longer process to get through and regulations have gotten a lot tighter which is great for the environment, great for the social aspect, but it does, it's gonna hurt supply going forward, which is gonna help metal prices perform even further. Lastly, uh, what are the milestones for the next 12 months, uh, Ivan? B biggest milestone is getting access to our Sombrero project, uh, and that will resume our exploration and put us drilling at some point this year. Uh, we anticipate that before the first half of the year, and then we would list our company. Our company's public, but it's not listing. And then we're making some key acquisitions in Ecuador. So our goal is to come out the first half of this year with an active project, mm -hmm. drilling for that world-class exploration project that's ready to drill and having a pipeline of two or three other opportunities that could meet that merit to capitalize on this huge demand that we just spoke about. Ivan, have a good 2023. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. <laughs> My name is Michael McRae with Kitco Mining here at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. Kitco Mining, special coverage of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference is brought to you by First Mining Gold. <laughs>